Hello, uh, my name is John Taylor. I'm Professor of Higher Education at the University of Lancaster in the Department of Educational Research. I'm delighted to be giving this presentation this morning. Uh, it's really nice to be talking to people both in Europe and in China. Uh, in many ways, I, I wish we were all face to face, but for obvious reasons, that's not the case at the moment, but I hope sometime not too distant future, we'll all be back together again and working together face to face. In the meantime, I'm really delighted to give this presentation and I hope the whole of the conference goes really well. My own background, uh, I've worked in universities now for over 40 years, which seems a very, very long time. I've worked most, much of my career was as a senior manager leader uh, in universities before I moved on to the academic side, teaching and researching in higher education. And I'm especially interested in issues to do with leadership, management, governance of higher education, of universities, and especially connected with internationalization. So in internationalization, I'm there especially interested in issues to do with research, how we manage research, how we lead research. But also I have an increasing interest in uh, new technology and the application of new technology in higher education. The presentation I'm going to give this morning is really based upon some research that we're doing uh, for a new book. Uh, book is hopefully going to be published sometime next year, but it's a collection of, of contributions from all over the world, looking at uh, how internationalization is impacting around the world, especially looking at some parts of the world which perhaps have been underrepresented in the literature to date. So we include studies of uh, various African countries, Latin American countries, uh, Asian countries, um, beyond just a sort of, we were trying to get away from a, from a preoccupation with internationalization from an American, British, European perspective to try and look at world issues. And some of that research is what I will be talking about this morning. So my aim this morning is to provide some insights into the changes that we're facing in internationalization at present. And there are many, many pressures for change and tensions facing internationalization in higher education. So let, let me start by trying to define what we actually mean by internationalization. Uh, the definition I still use and like using uh, is quite an old one now from Jane Knight, um, a Canadian academic. Um, and she talks about internationalization really in, a, in an all embracing way. She sees internationalization as having a, an impact on our universities, on higher education, really in every possible way, all the, the purpose, the functions and delivery. And I think that's a good starting point. I think it is important to see that internationalization has an impact on teaching, but on research. It has an impact on the way in which we run our universities, the way in which we manage our universities. I always remember uh, talking to somebody uh, in a British university uh, a few years ago who said that actually one of the most important sets of people who contribute to internationalization were the cleaning staff and cooking staff who worked in the university hostels. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, the reason is quite simple because those people often have more interaction and contact on a daily basis with international students than any academics do. They're the people that people know best. So I think it just underlines this, my own point, my own view, that internationalization has an impact across the whole of a university. And I think Jane Knight's definition sums that up well. 
More recently, other definitions have emerged, and I just quote the one there from Hans de Witt and Fiona Hunter, um, which in some ways is, the, is similar to Jane Knight's. It's taking it a bit further, and it's highlighting the wider contribution of education and research, not just to the staff and students, but a wider social impact as well to the countries, to the world of, at large. It's a slightly broader view of internationalization. I, I share it entirely. I think the commentary by Hans de Witt and Fiona Hunter is, is absolutely fine. Uh, I don't dis disagree with it in, in any way at all. Um, it's just a broader view of, of looking at things. Now, I think in, in looking at this also, it's important to just to keep in mind the, the breadth of activity that we understand by internationalization. Much attention over many years has always been attached to the movement of students, students going to study in a different country, different part of the world, in order to follow degree courses, undergraduate, postgraduate, other degree, other courses, the actual physical movement of students. And linked to that, we have the physical movement of staff, teaching staff, research staff, um, senior appointments, junior appointments, the actual physical movement of, stu of staff to work in another country. And in many countries now, universities are tr trying to diversify their staff base by attracting people from all over the world. The department I working at Lancaster has people from all over many different countries from around the world working in that department. It offers us a, a, a broad perspective on higher education issues and I personally just find it very enjoyable working alongside colleagues from all over the world. The research side as I said earlier is a particular interest of mine and I think internationalization of research activity is particularly interesting. Interesting in terms of development of institutional networks, um, how academic staff, research staff from different universities collaborate on projects, major projects, and how it actually leads to findings and outcomes, publications, uh, actual conclusions. Another growing area of internationalization now is the role of universities and academic staff in consultancy work. And sometimes this may not involve partnerships with other universities at all. It can just mean working with international governments, international business, international companies. Um, and it's, it's a further area of activity, a very often a very complex activity uh, leading to important in, <clears throat> and very interesting legal issues, sometimes financial issues, but it's a growing area of activity. Then we have the whole area now of transnational higher education, the delivery of programs fully or in part in locations remote from the awarding body. So many British universities uh, that I'm familiar with and work with uh, are running programs in all over the world, either individually on their own or in partnership with other universities. This is, of course, a growing area of activity, and I'm going to come back to this in more detail later in the presentation. But it's one which is uh, of growing interest and activity, especially in the sort of post COVID world and the use of new technology in the development of transnational higher education is of particular interest. And finally, when we're talking about internationalization, I think it's also important to keep in mind this, that what's often now referred to as internationalization at home. What we mean by this is that we, I think we always have to remember that the clear majority of all of our students in whatever country we're talking about actually do not travel uh, for study or for research. They're based in the home country. 
And so what internationalization at home is, is concerned with is how we actually create an international experience for students who are actually not moving. Now there's all sorts of ways this can be done, but most often we're looking at things like how do we make sure that the curriculum that we teach is suited to international uh, purposes? How do we give students a flavor of the culture of different countries? How do we actually increase such international awareness? And it's an interesting issue. It can be quite a difficult issue. Universities, I think, are often very sympathetic to it, but it's sometimes difficult to introduce as, a, as an area into the curriculum, especially in professional subjects, subjects that are aimed at particular external qualifications, where sometimes curriculum and universities and staff have little discretion over the curriculum they follow. So internationalization is a very broad area and covers many different activities, many different areas of work. So all of these different areas of activity are really now facing a, a wide range of, of issues that are pressing for change and, and new, new ways of working. But before I go into some of that, uh, I'm, a, I'm a historian by origin. And I think a little bit of historical perspective is, is also helpful. Internationalization is nothing, nothing new. Um, I am doing some work at the moment on universities in the late 19th century. And certainly if we're looking at European universities, the influence of German universities across Europe was absolutely profound at that time. In a way, it wasn't seen as internationalization, but it was in, in reality, universities influencing other universities across national borders. And in first, as, far, <clears throat> as far as international students are concerned, I was recently looking at uh, the student registers of, of some British universities in the late 19th century, and there were students from all over the world including, I might add, lots of Chinese students studying in British universities in the late 19th century. So internationalization is nothing new. But what has changed are some of the attitudes towards internationalization. I think it's fair to say that up until the middle of the 20th century, internationalization was, was almost accidental. It was unplanned. Um, it was the an individual student deciding they wanted to travel abroad or the individual academic member of staff wanting to travel abroad. It was very much a personal decision per, for, aimed at personal improvement. Towards the end of the 20th century, things were changing. I think there was a, it was a, in some ways a, a, a very positive time. It, there was a feeling that internationalization was something that was good. It was a good thing that needed to be encouraged and developed based on mutual understandings. And it's at that time that you start seeing regulatory frameworks developing uh, for how such relationships might be developed and encouraged. However, by the late 20th century, I think you start seeing other pressures beginning to emerge, financial pressures, growing market competition. So it wasn't just how do we increase our levels of internationalization, but it was how it's sort of how do we actually increase and get a higher level of internationalization than our competitor institutions. So the emphasis became not so much on internationalization as what I say is a good thing, but internationalization is a necessary thing. And how can we actually do better at it than our competitors? And you see that between individual universities competing with each other. You see it between individual countries competing with each other. As we move into the 21st century, then I think some of those pressures begin to increase still further. And we start seeing ideas of, of internationalization very much for national benefit and growing links between internationalization 
and nationalism. And I have to say, some of those feelings we see uh, in, in the UK, where I'm speaking from, uh, a growing feeling that internationalization is not just for the benefit of students, it's not just for the benefit of knowledge, but it's also intended to be for the benefit of the country. So I said there are lots of tensions and challenges emerging. Let me just quickly run through some of them. There is a, an interesting question as to whether internationalization is really about, is the main emphasis on teaching and learning, or is it on research and consultancy, or is it on both? Then there are real issues about whether internationalization is really for profit or not for profit. Uh, is it something which countries or individual universities should be seeking to make money from? Or is it something that is actually done for wider benefit? Then there are questions about governance. Who actually controls internationalization? What's the balance of power between international organizations, national organizations, or the universities themselves? Uh, and this is a very complex area. It's one of the ones, one of the topics we talk about in, in the book I mentioned, because governments can often play a very mixed role. We sometimes talk about governments as being judge and jury, um, because governments often set the rules, but they often then monitor those rules. But at the same time, they're often also encouraging universities to take more international activities. Then there are growing questions about the links between internationalization and national identity. Above all these areas, there are issues of quality. How do we actually ensure quality in our international work, whether it's teaching or research? I think <clears throat> there are new and increasing tensions emerging as well. How do we actually ensure that our environmental concerns are actually reflected in internationalization? Is it, to pose a question, is it actually right that millions of students and staff travel around the world, but normally by aeroplane, um, and you know, what's the impact of that on environmental issues at the moment. Um, another area of growing interest uh, is the issue of decolonization. To what extent do the, does the curriculum that we teach uh, reflect colonial past? But it also has a more immediate consequence. To what extent do certain countries dominate international activities, possibly at the expense of others? And this leads into issues of social responsibility. How do we ensure that internationalization actually is, has wider benefits? I often remember listening to actually an, a, an American university leader talking about internationalization. And she, made, she ended her speech with, with a very simple message. She said, leave, more, leave behind more than you take. And I think there's a quite a strong message in that, which we should all keep in mind. Finally, there's the whole issue of new technology, the impact of new to net technology, how that's actually changing the way in which we teach, it's changing the way in which we deliver our programs, and it's changing the way in which we conduct research activities. Many of my colleagues now are involved in major international research projects uh, research collaborations and actually are no longer physically meeting those colleagues in other countries. It's all being done online. So it's a new way of working, um, which I think raises all sorts of interesting opportunities, but also challenges as well. And now, of course, all of these tensions and all of these challenges are magnified by the background of COVID-19 and a worldwide pandemic, which is also pressing us and making us think about new approaches and new ways of tackling internationalization.
Now, what I want really now to focus on is how are we shaping our response? Now, throughout my career as a university leader, university manager, um, I was always interested in trying to understand some of the theory as well as the practical side of things. Um, I often think that by understanding theory and why things are happening, it actually helps people to identify on those practical issues, to understand how they can tackle issues, how they can actually begin to respond. So I would argue very strongly that there isn't that it, the importance of understanding and developing theory uh, can have real benefits in terms of how we run and, and lead our universities. So what I want to try and do in the rest of this presentation is talk a little bit about some of the emerging theory of how universities are changing. And I hope in that way point to some of the ways in which we can actually implement and uh, make some of the changes that I'm arguing for. Now, in the work that we've been doing, we've really identified two main drivers uh, which are uh, influencing how individual universities, how individual members of staff respond to some of these pressures. The first is the question of practicality. So, you know, how do we how do we respond? Is it actually possible to respond? What can be done? Very much the practical side of things. But secondly, what also became clear were issues not so much to do with can it be done, but do I want to do it? So we, we identified some quite important issues of motivation and desire, uh, the will or the unwillingness to respond, the, the desire to influence things and change things, or really a desire to sit back and let things happen without interfering. And so these two combined issues, practicality and motivation and desire, I think are really, it's important to understand both of them in order to see how we shape our response to changing factors of internationalization. So let me just offer some final thoughts. Um, I Clearly internationalization in higher education is changing rapidly. However, I don't think we're talking about an all or nothing. I think things will change. I think some, some things will stay very much the same. There are already some signs of adjustment, but there are also some signs of a return. Um, but I don't think it will be a return to how things were before. It will be a new thing. So I think we will start seeing use of new technology, use of new forms of delivery, whether it's teaching or research activity. I think in trying to think about this, I, what I've tried to highlight are some of the positives and the negatives. And I think as academic staff, as leaders uh, involved in the shaping of international activities, I think it's important to be aware of both some of those positives that I've mentioned and aware of some of the negatives. This is where I think trying to understand some of the theory can actually have a real benefit to us as we try and take forward our international activities. So I think in responding to these challenges, a key further message which I want to underline is the importance of leadership and management, the importance of training, how we actually develop our, our staff to deliver these programs. And I don't just mean academic staff, I mean administrative staff, managerial staff, staff at all levels, how they actually interact and work in international activities. Remember my case about the, clean, the cleaning ladies in the student hostels? Well, that university runs programs helping and training cleaning staff in university hostels as to the interactions with international students. So I think these things apply at all levels. And the sharing of experiences, 
across borders is, is an essential part of this. So this is my final thought, because this to me is where lead two comes into the story. It's that sharing of expertise, sharing of knowledge and developing knowledge across borders, which in my opinion, underpins the importance of the lead two program. At this point, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, clearly we're in different parts of the world at the moment, but if any of you ever do want to contact me or, or ask any questions um, outside of the conference, then please don't hesitate to contact me. I've left my uh, email address there and I would be delighted to hear from anybody at any time. Thank you.